The restartment of, of student loan payments, which is happening very soon, chat. I hope you're saving. hope you're preparing. And the second is housing costs are more unaffordable than ever. And housing is everybody's number one expense. So if you ask me how I'm doing and my rent has got a 50% and I can't pay it, even if I have a job, it feels like everything sucks. If I want to go out there and buy a house, it's impossible. There's no fucking, the, the prices are insane. The monthly payments are insane. So if you already have a house, you can't move. And it's, it's going, it's going batshit. Okay, I've mostly been avoiding this subject, but it's time this channel finally talked about housing. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation, although transportation is a bit tangential today. And I do get a ton of comments and messages asking me to talk about this or that aspect of housing, density, I bought a house that affordability. I'd rather rent? E and I don't know what kind of landlords you have, but they're always fucking terrible. Gentrification, displacement, land value tax. Why Believe are you paying me. for student loans when repayment starts? Yeah. Ah, uh, what do you want me to do? Destroy my credit completely? It never ends. And I've admittedly been avoiding this topic, partly because it's just a freaking minefield, but also partly because the subject is just so complex and multifaceted that I've really struggled with how to carve off a discrete part that I can turn into a sarcastic 12 to 15 minute YouTube video. Kind of makes me want to avoid the subject altogether. But what I can't get away from is that for people who want to live in walkable, transit-rich cities with tons of opportunity, and I feel like there are a growing number of us, it's not that much of a reach to say housing affordability is the defining issue of our time. So there are a lot of different directions I can go as far as a video topic for today. But I think the best place to start is just for me personally, as someone who has owned different kinds of homes in a high demand coastal city and as a YouTuber of modest trustworthiness, how I think about <laughs> housing as an expense and or as an investment. And as always, I'll bring data to the discussion so you can chew it over. Disclaimer. I mean, objectively, and I want to say this before he even says his answer, I want you to understand something. Objectively, housing is both on, in America. Objectively, America right now, housing is, is an investment asset, whether you like it or not. Because why? Because it yields like an investment asset. Because it increases its, it, both the asset value and the, uh, the cash return is positive because we're not making enough housing. So investor money is flowing into housing because there's a shortage and it returns. That's it. Remember though, housing economics is not my professional wheelhouse. I don't claim any special expertise here beyond being someone with a planning background who's spent their whole life in expensive West Coast cities. Yeah, I only have a, a city planning background. What do I know about housing? <laughs> I love people that are smart with expertise because they always act like they know less than the, the just the dumbest motherfuckers who don't know that Cyp where Cyprus is, that don't know Portugal is in Europe. Those dumb, dumb motherfuckers will tell you everything you need to know about South African politics, but the guy who spent his life in planning will be like, I don't know that much about housing. Incredible. And honestly, the thing that really pushed me into doing this was somebody forwarded me this web article higher urban densities associated with the worst housing affordability with the idea that I was supposed to react to it somehow. Well, I don't remember who sent it, but I guess now you're getting your reaction. So the article does some extremely basic analysis of American community survey data to show that huge shocker, Housing prices are higher in metro areas that have higher densities. But then they imply that what it's showing is that 
Instead of increased densities helping to mitigate housing affordability issues, it just makes everything more expensive. As far as I can tell, there's nothing wrong with the math itself, just the interpretation. I mean, yeah, housing is more expensive in cities that have higher density, but the article almost certainly gets the causality backwards. There's more density in those cities because there's more demand to live in them with higher willingness to pay, which means multifamily developments are a lot more likely to pencil out. The article really just promotes the whole narrative of new construction being luxury housing and people who support building more market rate housing being developer shills or whatever. And it's the type of baldly dishonest thing libertarian think tanks love to crank out hoping and it, it, probably I, I, knowing. I want to say something straight off the bat. Market rate housing is not going to solve the housing crisis. Never has, never will. You could deregulate all you want. It's not going to work. First you deregulate and then they're going to demand subsidies. You give, you give a developer a cookie, they're going to want a glass of milk. Let me just put it to you that way. You want actually affordable housing? It must be non-profit, limited profit, government housing. That's it. If you're just relying on upzoning and de uh, deregulation, it's not gonna work. Which is why these Yimbies can never point to any place in the entire fucking world that it is working in. To a certain extent, that people won't apply enough critical thinking to see why it's nonsense. Sorry, that was kind of a side rant. What I really want to talk about today is how we think about home ownership in America, and in particular, how we think about it as an Not investment. Work. By the way, disclaimer, I have no intention of turning this into a personal finance channel. Although, if you watched my Virgo, cost of car ownership video, you could be forgiven for thinking otherwise. So let's start with the conventional wisdom that buying a house is a good investment. And let's recognize that taking on a mortgage and building home equity is a very typical path to building wealth. And for a large number of US households, home equity is an overwhelmingly large part of their net worth. And you have to have a place to live regardless, so why not have at least part of your monthly payment going toward building equity instead of just giving it all to a landlord? It's just not that straightforward though. There are a ton of variables to consider when you're thinking about whether to own or whether to rent. For one thing, it's not a passive investment. There's constant maintenance and upkeep money and maybe worse time that you have to spend on repairs renovations yard work Ugh. there's mortgage interest that's gonna depend on what the rates were when you bought and there are property taxes and insurance that are gonna vary by where you live and maybe the by the way when you are paying rent that's what you're paying for so your landlord takes your check and he divides it among those different things. And then he pockets some money. Then he gets to keep, you know, because a large percentage of that is being used to pay down the principal and interest of the loan to purchase the property. So in other words, it's like moving money from one pocket to the other for the landlord. You worked for that money. So congrats. Biggest thing is you don't know when you're going to want to or have to sell. Life is unpredictable career changes, relationship changes, needing to be right. closer to family, needing to be a lot further away from family. It's hard to anticipate any of these things and that's probably what makes home buying such a fraught decision. As an investment, it's really hard to say what the rate of return is on a home. You can look at data from the Fed and see that over time, the average sale price of a house has seen about a five to 6% compound annual growth rate, which is better than- uh, <laughs> Wow. Remember, it's also fulfilling your shelter need. Ohio chatters, remember to get out and vote today. Yes, definitely. If you're no Ohio, I shit on you, but don't let your, st your state become worse inflation over the same period but worse than the stock market it's not even that simple though keep in mind houses today aren't what they were in the early 1960s 
The average size of a new home back then was closer to a thousand square feet and the average size of a new home today is more like 2,500 square feet. So between all the variables and the apples to oranges nature of the data, it's hard to say what kind of return you should expect from a home, maybe two to 5% per year. But the other thing is the housing market is volatile. Let's go back to that Fred chart. If you buy your house in 2007 and then for whatever reason you had to sell in the next five years, life being unpredictable, you most certainly did not get two to 5% in annual returns. The other piece- This is like true of like every possible investment. Like if you pick the top of a bubble and the bottom of the deflation, yeah, you can lose money. Nothing's guaranteed. But over time, housing in America has become more and more unaffordable. Like, and having bought 10 years ago, if you had bought a house 10 years ago, you've probably, or that doubled your investment. So keep that in mind. He says, a home is not very liquid and there's a pretty big transaction cost. You can't go on a website and click sell like you would with some shares from an index fund. There's a lot of work involved prepping a place for sale and there are a whole bunch of closing costs and commissions that eat into your returns. Look, what I'm not saying here is that owning a home is a bad idea. Having your own place is rewarding in a lot of non-monetary ways. Fixing up a place exactly the way you want it can be, for example, very psychologically rewarding. I mean, it is deeply liberating to be able to paint rooms chartreuse if you want. So the best advice I've seen on this is to think of your home as an expense first and an asset that contributes to your net worth, if you're lucky, second. Okay, I'm sure you could tell I have mixed feelings about all this. And what I wanna do next is talk about why the idea of a dwelling unit as an investment can be corrosive to society, especially in the- Oh, I couldn't agree more. Thank you, this argument is so true. Housing as an investment is corrosive to society. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. This is one of the things that kind of makes people mad at me is like I could agree that a, uh, housing as an investment is corrosive to society but it's also correct to do currently like I could say I'm gonna buy a house because right now based on current conditions and future trends that is gonna make me a hell of a lot more secure myself and for my family than me going I'm ideologically opposed to owning your own home I want to create, and here's the thing, I am ideologically consistent enough that I can act in my own interest while also understanding that I need to change society so that was a mistake. I would rather live in a society where, uh, you know, people own a home and then house prices remain flat because we build so many high quality public housing alternatives and, and co-ops and everything else. And housing becomes less and less of an expense for everybody. And so my housing prices uh, stay flat or decline over time. Then we tell you, oh, ideologically, I don't think you should do that. And then housing is 10 times more expensive in 20 years. And there's no chance whatsoever of you ever getting onto the ladder of security. I'd love to live in public, stable, comfortable, guaranteed housing. I tell you... Vienna has the best housing market in the world, in my opinion. And they do it because a majority of people live in nonprofit housing, public housing, co-ops. And they have a dedicated system to pr pump out more and more social housing. And they do it every year. So, like, I have a model, and that's the model I want to promote. Mike, I got in trouble and had to take court-mandated classes. classes. I'm halfway through, and Dennis Prager shows up in the section about values. What state? The time we're living through right now. And to do that, I am gonna take a closer look at some more recent data. So let's get a little more current and look at a time frame we're gonna be more familiar with, which is the housing market since the beginning of the millennium. Maybe a bit arbitrary, but there's a reason, which is the monthly data Zillow publishes for its home value index or ZHVI 
only goes back to January 31st of 2000. But that does give us a 20 plus year span where we've had some really significant ups and downs in the economy. And ZHVI lets us drill down into specific cities and housing types. So that's what we're gonna do. One thing here is you can see the same strong uptick at the onset of the pandemic that you saw in the FRED data. I'm sure there are a lot of theories about this, but I think commercial slash office real estate got a lot less valuable and space in the home became much more of a premium for a lot of people. But there's been a dip in the last few months, so who knows? There are so many factors that go into things like this. Anyway, is, uh... what's really interesting to me is when you peel it apart into single family houses and condos slash co-ops, which ZHVI does let you do. And the numbers do back up the conventional wisdom, which is that on average, a detached single family house appreciates faster than a multifamily dwelling unit. I think this is really important and I'm gonna come back to why. But first, let's talk about what might make detached single family homes appreciate faster than multifamily. I mean, it's understandable why they'd be priced lower in the first place. They're usually smaller and people might not like having a homeowners association and an HOA generally does come with the territory. But here's another theory. If you've ever owned a house, your property tax bill probably contains separate assessed values for the structure and for the land it sits on. If you own a condo, those values might be rolled together, or they could be separate, say if you own an attached townhouse, but either way, the land piece of the assessed value is gonna be proportionately much smaller for a condo than it would be for a detached single family house. And here's the thing, just like a car is a depreciating asset, a residential structure is also a depreciating asset, although maybe a bit slower. They deteriorate over time and eventually they get replaced. It's important to understand that that is true. That is absolutely true. And that's good, actually. It's good, actually. And that's one of the reasons why I want a Viennese housing model is, is if you build these structures that are intended to be refurbished and renewed over time they last longer and they return more i mean karl marx hof is still there it's not because it's still the same it was in 1925 or 1930 it is because they have refurbished it and they have changed the layout and they have combined apartments and they have done things to update it to the 21st century. Land, on the other hand, is not a depreciating asset. It's a resource which, by definition, has a fixed supply. And pretty basic economic theory. I mean, it's just insane to have these single family homes like this. This is crazy. As if supply of a good is fixed, but demand is constantly increasing, you get higher prices. So if there's an investment part of buying a house, it's really that land component. And because the land component of a single family house is proportionally higher than it is for a condo, houses are usually gonna be a better investment value. This is no small thing because I think it really goes to the heart of what is probably the biggest issue in urbanism, which is we've got a growing number of people who want to live in a relatively small number of walkable, transit-rich U.S. cities. So how do we build more housing and more density in these places where we've got the biggest affordability problems? The fact that single family houses have this advantage in investment value, and that value is such a big part of a lot of people's net worth, especially in coastal cities, creates a huge problem. Let's go back to econ yeah. one. Yeah, I mean, he's right, he's right. Because like, if the policies that I want happen, gonna mean housing is less valuable in somewhere like LA. If the housing policies I want were implemented, Los Angeles housing would decrease in value. Hassan would lose money. Make Hassan not a millionaire again. Build social housing in West Hollywood.
101. When supply goes up, prices go down. So if you own a home, at least from the perspective of your personal balance sheet, it's in your financial interest for there to be as few new homes as possible. Really, what we're talking about here is an ethical question and a political one. How do people balance their personal financial interests against what's socially just? Different people answer this question differently. That's called living in a society. The way I answer it is I'm renting a smaller apartment, partly because I'm a bit itinerant right now, but partly as a values decision, kind of in the same way you can take an ethical approach to investing in the stock market by investing in companies that are socially and environmentally responsible. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> I love them, but come on, man. There's not a surprise that the, cut, the, 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 the corporations that have the most positive environmental ratings are from countries with the strictest state regulation. You're never, ever, never, ever, never, ever, ever, ever going to change capitalism by investing in the stock market. It's just not going to happen. And you pay a premium to do this, by the way, which means lower returns, which iron law of capitalism. If you're making suboptimal investment decisions because of your values, the people that do not make suboptimal investment decisions over time will have more capital, which means they will be able to dominate more of the market. The market has to be constrained from the outside. It cannot be constrained from the inside. It won't work. That's why I am a socialist and not a lib. You can approach the home ownership decision the same way. You can buy or rent a place that's aligned with the way you want to live, even if it doesn't have quite the anticipated ROI that a detached single family house would. Or honestly, go ahead and buy the single family home, but don't close the door behind you and become the person that opposes new housing at every turn. I agree. This really isn't the type of thing that tends to solve itself by depending on individuals to do the right thing. Though. Right. So as far as exactly. effective market interventions, I'm going to save that for a future episode because it's just too much to get into right now. But leave me your favorite silver bullets and theories down in the comments. And that is all I got. Thanks for joining today. And I mean, my, my personal opinion is direct government provision of housing. And as well as if you're kind of a little bit softer left than me, programs to create non-cooperative, to create cooperative housing and limited profit housing development that is heavily regulated, rent control, and just decommodification of housing in general. I, I think Vienna is the best housing market because for the average person, housing is decommodified and a right. But if you're a wealthy piece of shit and you want some super luxury housing, it exists. You're able to go into the market and pay a premium for better housing. You want to own your own home? You're allowed to own your own home in Vienna. It's just most people don't want to own a home. Most people just want to live at a high quality apartment with a pool with parks with access to transit with high speed internet with you know indoor pool you know with a grocery store on site with you know you know what i'm talking about vienna and singapore have several similar, similar models for housing singapore is not as it is a little bit more government dominated in a certain way, but it's not as good because um, it's a right-wing dictatorship. <laughs> I would be fine with renting if I wasn't paying the same amount as a mortgage, but and they're also their housing prices are spiral spiraling in Singapore now. It would be fine with renting if I wasn't paying the same amount as a mortgage, but not gaining any equity. Well, yeah. Yeah. Although buying a house right now is the worst time to buy a house in history. You know, interest rates. But prices spiked, but they haven't come down. Oh, it makes me so mad. It makes me so mad. Thanks to the patrons for keeping me busy adding new pages to the credits I have to roll every week. How is support... Vienna compared to the Japanese market? It seems like Japan has been able to stabilize housing prices. Uh, Vienna has much higher quality housing. 
Japan has a lot more of a culture of living in a pod. Whereas in Vienna, housing has become larger over time. In Japan, it's like pods and shit. Tenements, basically. I don't know about you, chat, but I want like a three-bedroom or two-bedroom apartment. I don't want to live in a efficiency. It does make it feasible for me to keep doing this for the foreseeable future. And running out of topic ideas isn't going to be a problem anytime soon, I don't think. I am always on the lookout for good ones, though, so keep them coming. I'll be back with a new episode next week, and I'll see you then. I like I like City Nerd. I, I, I like him. I'm subscribing. I'm subscribing. Uh, he, seems, he seems decent. I mean, he's also, let's be honest, to my right, but it doesn't matter. We can, we can, we can agree on certain things. And by the way, and I want to say this personally, I'm biased toward building things. Old school Marxist. Okay. I think the three gorges dam is based. I think your opinion on a three gorges dam kind of tells you what kind of leftist you are. Do you think the three gorges dam is based or not? I do. Three gorges dam. Amazing. The Three Gorges Dam is a hydroelectric gravity dam that spans the Yangtze River. It has the world it's the world's largest power station in terms of installed capacity, 22,500 megawatts. It produces it generates an average of 95 plus or minus 20 terawatts of energy per year. After extensive monsoon rainfalls in 2020, the dam's annual production reached nearly 112 terawatts, breaking the previous world record of 103 terawatts terawatts hours set by the Atupto Vam, which is in uh uh Paraguay. But many people will go, ah, oh, it's so terrible. They had to make people move. It has environmental impact. Okay, listen. I understand. 